Coming up on Tech News Today, Google and Microsoft are in a fight over search. Google claims Bing is copying Google's search results. It's a name-calling smackdown. Also, is the Kindle going to get kicked off the iPad? Sony Reader did. And the internet is out of addresses. Now what do we do? We'll tell you next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, February 1st, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle the used gadgets lying around your home or office. Don't just sell it, Gazelle it! For a 5% bonus payment for your used gadgets, go to gazelle.com. Use the bonus code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I am Becky Worley. And I'm Jason Howell. Oh my gosh, it's what? Becky Worley. I'm back. I missed you guys so much. How Big was your... Uh, hug. How is your travel into pajama jeans territory? Listen, somebody has to investigate pajama jeans, and it's going to be me. I hear you did undercover lunches. I did. I wore them all around San Francisco and tried to see if anybody would sneer at me. But sadly, San Francisco. Well, I, yeah, I was going to say, you should have worn them around like New York or Chicago. I mean, not, I mean, San Francisco, no, no, no disrespect. But pajama jeans are not the weirdest thing you will see on the street any given day. No, but I did put on a pajama jeans fashion show. So I'm just telling you, I wasn't here because I was doing cutting edge investigative work. But I hope you people can forgive me. We are glad to have you back just in time for a name calling contest. Oh, I love a good smackdown. Between Google and Bing. Oh, yeah. So the, the top headline here is Google says Bing is copying their search results. But there's a really interesting story in how they figured out that Google, that, that Bing was copying their search results. It's like a deep film noir kind of mystery. Did you, so, know, did you know that Google has a department of spelling? I did not know this, yeah. but misspellings, they say that their algorithms to find the correct search results for misspelled words is the best. So they, they monitor this apparently. Tom. And so the first clue in our big mystery dun, dun, was, that, dun, 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 was that Google noticed that despite a word being misspelled and the misspelling not being corrected, Bing still managed to get the right pages at the top of their results and the same pages that Google was getting for their misspelled word. I knew that it was trouble when I saw a misspelled word spelled right on Bing. <gasps> right. And then... <laughs> The next iteration of our mystery goes like this. The Google people started to notice that the top 10 pages were eerily similar. Back in October, they looked at their metrics across a pretty wide range of searches, and they noticed that Big, Bing was showing a huge overlap with Google's top 10 results, more so than in any of the preceding months. I'm imagining like someone in a Sherlock Holmes hat and a big magnifying glasses. These top 10 results are similar. <laughs> Watson, fetch me a sting. Nice, Howell. Thank That's you. where the sting came in. So, as I understand this, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Tom, uh, Google creates about 100 of what they call synthetic searches, totally made-up words. Um, and we're talking, like, crazy words like MXZZVRBLD. And then they force a set of results that have nothing to do with it. And they tell those, they tell 20 Google engineers to go to their laptops at home, to use Internet Explorer with suggested sites and the Bing toolbar enabled, and search for those exact terms. It's a honeypot. It was. It was a honeypot. And within about 14 days, the same results, these totally synthetic results, started showing up on Bing. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I couldn't believe my eyes <laughs> when I did a search for Umbazirkspagigis and saw the same result for the Wiltern seating chart and tickets to the Wiltern show up on both Bing and Google. 
It was the most <laughs> damning evidence I'd ever seen. We mock this um, mystery, but given that search is such a huge business and that Bing is attempting to compete with Google, this is dirty pool, right? Yeah, it was a Bing sting. <laughs> it was a Bing sting. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so a couple couple of things to, to throw in here. Uh, first of all, there, there was a, it was December 17th when they started the sting. And they that by December 31st, they started seeing some of the results. Now, I think only, what, seven to nine of the hundred faked pages that they created actually showed up on Bing. So it was a low percentage that actually did show up. It wasn't every single page. And this was a huge deal for Google because they said, we have never spiked results before. We didn't have the capability. We had to invent it for this. And we're taking it away right now because we don't want to mess with our, our holy algorithm that was passed along by Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, <laughs> we, 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 you know, it's, it's, it is sacrilege for us to do this, but we had to do it to show that, that Bing was copying our results. Now, Microsoft has responded to this saying, like, we take cues from lots of data points, uh, lots of data signals. Uh, and, and we're not copying Google's search results. Our results are different, as can be seen. Uh, but it really came to a head today at the Farsight 2011 conference here in San Francisco. Google's Matt Cutts and Microsoft's Harry Shum were on stage. Uh, Microsoft says they just discovered a new source of spam and click fraud, uh, that they were just, you know, adding, adding more data. Cuts said, this is the first time I've seen someone doing like this. Uh, it's, it's shocking uh, and disappointing. Uh, and Shum responded uh, that Google makes a lot of money from spam and low-quality content monetized by AdSense ads. So take that. Cuts Whoa. denied that, saying Google kicks a spammer out of its ranking. Shum dared Google to be more transparent. Then they got up and just started wailing. <laughs> well, no, they didn't do that. But... Uh, yeah, some some harsh words at a at a conference. Uh, Google and Microsoft in a in a bit of a tiff tiff over this. I think it's WWSEO. It's like <laughs> a real smackdown. WWSEO uh, smackdown. <laughs> and it's it's interesting because when Microsoft issued their generic statement, it was really oblique in terms of what were they saying? We use multiple signals and approaches in ranking search results. Uh, we want to do a better job. Uh, we, you know, and it was really, really ambiguous when they first set out this generic response. And then Mary Jo Foley called and said, okay, what does this thing say? Do you or do you not steal their results? And they said, we do not copy or steal Google's results. So I, I think it's clear that Microsoft is collecting information from Google searches and mm -hmm. using it to create their index. Because if they, and I think it's clear that they're not copying they're not flat out copying because if they did all 100 of those sites would have eventually showed up it's part of their algorithm yeah. the question is isn't that public information isn't well, that something but yeah that no the, ult the ultimate question is is this a bad thing that microsoft right. is looking at google search results to inform their own it's not a copyright problem because they're not they are they're right they're not copying you know sentence for sentence every result of google but mm -hmm. it's probably clever and smart to say Google's in the lead. Let's actually take a cue from what they rank highly, put it into our own, and make an actual better algorithm because of that. Google thinks that that's unethical and unfair. Do you agree? Um, you know, it begs the question, what is what are you paying for when you decide to advertise with Bing as opposed to with Google? You know, that's the bottom line is, is how does this affect the bottom line? And ultimately, what it makes me realize is that the search engine itself is, is to some extent, probably more about marketing than actual results for the end user. You know, I mean, they want the one that returns the best results, but they also get a feel from the search engine and that's why they use it. Or it's just the default on whatever browser they're using. I am over so, two weeks into uh, my experiment in using Bing as my primary search engine instead and? of Google. Uh, I have found a few things that Bing does not do as well as Google. But for the most part, I would say 80% to 85% of my searches, I don't even notice the difference. Hmm. Yeah. Does it feel different to you, the whole picture thing and the, you know, the background being different, or did you turn that off? Oh, no, I, I, I've got that there. It definitely feels different. In fact, 
that was one of the interesting things when I first started using Bing was that sort of feeling of like, oh, this isn't going to be as good. There's like a psychological feeling when I saw the Bing layout that hmm. wasn't that was involuntary of like, oh, this is a lesser page. And then I would think, no, it's not. It's Bing. It's a fine search engine. And I would go ahead and do the search. But there was that. I've gotten over that. I don't feel that anymore. But Google has really well branded itself as with its simplistic style, meaning quality, and mm -hmm. anything else that you mm -hmm. use kind of feeling cheap. I wonder if that's just because you're so inside the industry and your presumption is based on, you know, the, the, the shaky start for Microsoft Search and whether for the average user, they see it as sort of like an Easter egg that they get with a different picture every day and that that makes them feel like they're going on a journey or exciting and not yeah, really maybe. being about I, I think it's all about experience. I think it's about what you're used to. And, 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 and I don't think it has to do with being inside the industry. It has to do with usage. I think it's because I've used Google for so long. I've been trained mm. to think this means good searching by Google. Uh, speaking of Microsoft having problems, they're also having problems with Windows Phone 7. We've mentioned this before. Uh, Windows Phone 7 has been accused of leaking data. People have said, I haven't been using my phone that much and I reached my data cap. How did this happen? Uh, Microsoft had confirmed earlier this month that there was a problem with a third-party application using too much data. Last night, or yesterday afternoon, I think, researcher Rafael Rivera uh, posted on a blog that Yahoo's IMAP server does not respond to fetch requests correctly. So when you check your email, sometimes you will get 25 times as much data as you need to answer the request. Whether you have email or not, this has nothing to do with the actual downloading of the email. It's just the, the processing of the fetch request. Uh, which is which is weird because they've offered they say they're working on a solution but they've offered a workaround which is go into settings and turn off automatic fetching and just do it manually um which but, essentially means you fetch less so you're at less risk of having that 25 times as much data because you're right not but every but if you check or they also said you can turn down the frequency but you know you would assume that if the problem was amount of data and the solution was turning down the frequency then the problem would be the frequency of, of checking it but they're saying it's actually the the actual data transmitted in each request but whatever yeah it's if, if you so what they're saying is change your setting from download new content uh to to be manual instead of automatic that way it only checks mail when you launch the mail app kind of inconvenient but that way there's you know, it's not constantly checking and downloading all of that data with the multiple fetch requests. So that gets rid of a lot of data usage right there. And then uh, when, it, when you do download new content, uh, download email from settings should be last seven days instead of last month or last two weeks. Then mm -hmm. you're downloading, you're, you're looking through fewer requests. And so that then there's, there's less of that data multiplier happening there. But you're basically just saying, have it ping the server less until we figure out how to stop it from sending you 25 times as much data as it needs to. Yeah, thanks. Don't need all that data. I'll pass. Yeah, uh, Microsoft has confirmed that this is a problem. They said, yes, we are working with Yahoo. It is Yahoo. Uh, they suggested this workaround, and then Yahoo has actually copped to it as well. They posted uh, something this afternoon saying, yeah, we apologize. Our fault. We're working on a solution in the next couple weeks, but for now, and they offer the same solution. Apple today uh, is accused of rejecting the Sony Reader app. Sony <laughs> says one thing. Apple says another about why it's being rejected. But both things are bad for the Kindle. Uh, Sony says that they were, the Reader was rejected because Apple told them you can't have outside content purchased show up in the app. And you have to sell apps through our in-app purchase situation. So if I'm yep. using the Sony Reader app, I've got to sell my books through Apple. Right. And, and the way I understood it, which is a little bit different from the way you said it, so clear me up if I'm wrong here, is you can't have items that are available for purchase outside of the app that aren't also available for purchase well, inside the app. What you're saying is what Apple says they said. Right. What I said is what Sony said. Apple said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. You, you, you've, you've summarized the Apple response, which is no, no, no. We didn't say you could never sell things outside. That would be silly. We haven't changed our guidelines at all, but we're now requiring, which implies to me that they've changed how they force them at the very least. 
We're now requiring that anytime you sell things outside of an app, you also must sell it in app and use our in app system. Got it. And and the issue there is that if you purchase something in app, let's say you purchase a book from Amazon, then an automatic 30% of that purchase goes to Apple, which is the profit margin that Amazon says it is taking on each of its ebook sales. So basically it becomes um, a, a, a no profit or a loss situation for Amazon if they sell things in app. Yeah, everybody, um, everybody is talking about this in regards to the Kindle because right now that's one of the major reasons people read books on iPad. Right. It's, it's a no-brainer. And you actually have to go out and back in to purchase through the iPad. Is that right? I haven't bought a book. Yeah, the way, the, the way the Kindle app works on the iPad, and I think it works the same on Android, uh, when, you, when you click on Get Books, it takes you to the Safari web browser and, and bumps okay. you right into the, uh, into the, the, the uh, Amazon Kindle store, and then you buy the book. And you say, send it to my, my Kindle app on the iPad. You go back to the Amazon Kindle app, and then you download it. It'll be waiting there in your archive, and you download it and add it to the app. What Apple is saying is, now we're going to require you to sell it as an in-app purchase, as well as offering it over on the website, which means... Kindle would make all the money when it's sold on the website, but who would do that if they can just buy it within the app without leaving to go to that web browser? Well, I'm, I'm guessing we're going to get a lot more clarity on this issue after tomorrow when Apple uh, announces the new daily newspaper from mm. Rupert Murdoch's company, and we find out about the in-app subscription plan that they have. Hmm. I contacted Amazon to see if the Kindle folks had anything to say about this, and they are suspiciously quiet on the topic. Um, I think they're not wanting to stir the pot until it becomes an issue. Well, but... it would be really bad for Apple if Amazon withdrew the Kindle app because it's right. uh, because yeah. it's a huge booster for for how people for why people want to get the iPad. At the same time, it's also one of the reasons that the iBook store probably isn't taking off better than it is because everyone's using Kindle to read books on the iPad instead of going to the iBook store because the perception is there aren't any books there. Yeah. I mean, do you think this would be um, the first salvo in that or is this just happened to be serendipitous because of the Sony app? I think it's counterproductive for Apple to get rid of Amazon or even Barnes and Noble because there's a Nook app as well that allows you to read the Nook uh, books. I think they're trying to draw a line in the sand and say to Sony, we're not going to allow this anymore unless we get a cut. Uh, mm -hmm. Sony posted a note on its website noting that it has opened a dialogue with Apple to see if we can come up with an equitable resolution, but we have reached an impasse at this time. So it sounds like Sony is blocked, that they they can't figure out how to do this without giving Apple 30%, and they don't want to give Apple 30%. Uh, my guess is there might be some more favorable terms, if not just for Amazon and Nook, maybe for Sony, after the new in-app subscription system comes online. Uh, but but the, days, uh, the days that we've lived in up till now where Apple would just let apps, you know, take care of this on their own and not take a cut are over. Yeah, and it's, it's also interesting from an Amazon perspective because it's, you know, buy once, read everywhere. And then you also have to look at the customer service aspect of this. In the chat room, uh, Mac Photo Guy says, I'd prefer to buy a book as an in-app purchase without going out into the browser. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's... That's what it's, Apple's counting on. Yeah, and, and it is easier for the consumer. And if Apple drops the hammer and says that's how you do it, Amazon is really between a rock and a hard place. And this seems like a place where when you are an Amazon and you have the leverage of that company and their real stranglehold on ebooks, they might be able to be the one entity that could negotiate something with Apple. But then again, if Apple opens that door, does that open it for everyone to negotiate that percentage? And yeah, Apple has been known to give people most favored nation status on certain guidelines, interpreting them in certain ways that are favorable to Apple one way or another. Uh, I, I do think if if Amazon was gone, a lot of people might go move back to the Kindle. They might not or they might forego purchasing an iPad. They might just get rid of devices. I wonder how many people think about it that um, on that sort of a granular of a level about which which reader you're going to use for your books. I mean, I guess if you're transitioning from an old Kindle and you're like, well, if I have to buy a new one or 
you know, buy an iPad. I know, well, yeah, I know a lot iPad. of people who bought an iPad saying, you know what, I'm, I'm in the Kindle ecosystem and that, that makes it easy for me. I'm going to buy the iPad because I can read my Kindle books on there instead of buying a new Kindle because my old right. Kindle's getting worn out uh, and do all of these other things where it would have been a diff more difficult decision if they couldn't read Kindle apps on the iPad. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, if you're going to get rid of a bunch of your devices, you should probably look at our sponsor today. <laughs> uh, nice. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle. Most of us want the latest gadgets one way or another, whether whether they've got these problems we're talking about or not. Uh, and one way to fund that purchase is to sell your old gadgets. So you want, you've got old phones, MP3 players. Who uses an MP3 player? I use my phone. Get rid of those things. Laptops, gaming consoles, anything you got lying around that you want to get rid of. Go to gazelle.com and find out how much they'll pay you for it. It's really easy. You go to gazelle.com, you type in the name of your gadget, you type in the condition, what cables you've got for it and everything, and they will give you an instant estimate of what they can pay you. You don't have to list it. You don't have to monitor the sale. All you have to do is accept that, and they will send you a check as soon as you send in the device. And if you're really extremely lazy, like I have been often, they'll even send you a box with the label. So you wait, you get the box, you put your device in it, you go to the post office, drop it off. It's prepaid. The postage is already paid, so you don't have to mess with that. You send it off to Gazelle, and then they will send you a check. They can send it to you as a, uh, a gift certificate for Amazon. They can send it to you as PayPal. They can send it to you as a check. And because you're listening to Tech News Today... If you take advantage of this, you will get a 5% bonus on that uh, purchase as well, or on that sale as well. So if you want to show your support for Tech News Today and you got a gadget relying around that you want to get rid of anyway, this is the easiest way to do it. Go to gazelle.com, use the offer code TNT for a 5% bonus, make yourself some money, keep us on the air, and make somebody else happy out there because they get a used gadget. In fact, even if you're not going to make any money, if you got your that's not, I, Tom, I'd love to do this, but I got something so old, it's just not. I, I'm not going to make any money on it. Gazelle will take that anyway, and they will recycle it responsibly. Go to gazelle.com and look at their uh, recycling situation. Uh, they help to make sure that e-waste goes to the right place instead of ending up in some junk pile out in Hong Kong. So check them out, gazelle.com, and we thank them for their support. On now to the end of the internet. <laughs> As we know it. Yes. Uh, they are reporting now that APNIC, the regional internet registry in Asia, has requested the last available two slash eights of IPv4 addresses. Those slash eight blocks, once they're given to APNIC, trigger a policy where the five blocks remaining will now be redistributed to the regional internet registries, the five families of the internet, AFRINIC, Aaron here in the Americas, APNIC in Asia, LACNIC in Latin America, and RIPE in the Middle East and Europe. Each of them <laughs> will get one more slash eight, and then we're out. That's it. And how long do we think this will last us? It was estimated they would go till September of 11? A APNIC thinks that the slash eights that they just got will last them three to six months. And from then on, they'll be taking their, their last bit of that block as a special allocation to help people transition to IPv6, and they estimate that could last them up to five years. So do we ration? Really, Tom? Do we yeah, just start the rationing that's essentially now? what's going on. We were talking on triangulation uh, with the head of SonicNet, uh, and he was saying he doesn't think we'll ever get off IPv4 mm -hmm. because what's going to happen is we're going to recycle. We're going to find ways to take unused IPv4 addresses and reuse them and retransfer them, and... People will slowly switch to IPv6, but it'll just stretch out for years and years and years. So he's not too worried that we're going to run out of addresses. But but the problem will be if you're trying to get to an IPv6 website in the future and you don't have IPv6 machinery, you won't be able to get to all of the web. Hmm. So you can't I see this just this story. It continues to baffle me. It's a it's machine language based. It's just the addresses. Right. And so the address has to be translated uh, so that your computer knows what server to connect to and, mm -hmm. and how to connect to it. If if you're using an IPv6 address and you're on a machine that doesn't have the understanding of that, it doesn't know what to do with that information. The computer's <laughs> saying, here's the IPv6 address you need to go to. And your computer goes, I don't know what that means. I'm only, only speak IPv4. <laughs> so 
if you've got a modern computer, you've got IPv6. Uh, browsers have to understand IPv6 to be able to route that that number as well. But it's a, it's essentially like you know going uh, with with a bunch of old English currency, you know, the 240 pennies in a in a in a pound, <laughs> and saying, okay, you're I, I'm ready to pay, and they're like, okay, it's a pound 65, and you're like, well, pound 65, what? I've got the I've got the old currency. What is that in old currency? Well, we don't speak old currency. We only speak new currency. <laughs> well, I'll just um, I'll just we can go over to your IPv6 bomb shelter when the time comes, and I'll just hunker down. Yeah, okay? I, don't, I don't think this is going to be any 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 big shakes actually. And if you are interested in this, IANA.org has a list of who has what blocks in the IPv4 address space registry. And if you go right now, there's only five unallocated blocks all the rest are either allocated or reserved or had been given out in the past and marked as legacy it's it's a uh, it's it's pretty interesting and you and then you can start diving in if you're really into this sort of thing samsung's lee young he says i was misunderstood wall street journal thought i said uh that sales of the da galaxy tab are quite small i said quite smooth Quite smooth. You said you heard this, right, Becky? Yeah, I went and listened to it, and she, I thought it was very clear. She said smooth. Um, the the whole um, vernacular as it played out was sort of choppy and a little bit hard to understand, but that was more syntax, syntax than pronunciation. Um, but I, I don't understand how this became such a hubbub because it didn't sound anything like small to me. But apparently that caused a little ripple effect, and now they're correcting and backstepping. At the same <laughs> time, however... Uh, we have some information from ITG Investment Research that points out that through December 2010, 13% of Galaxy tabs were returned, and ITG figures cum cumulative Galaxy tab return rates through January 15th were 16%. Ouch. Compare that That's to the return rate of iPad at Verizon, where you have to buy the MiFi to make it work, uh, and that, uh, that, that return rate is only 2%. Well, now, you know, I thought that, you know, the Galaxy Tab was pretty well received. Everybody liked the form factor for the most part. Uh, you were kind of in one camp or another. Uh, do you think that this is, an, you know, a Froyo issue, that it's just that, that the OS is just kludgy for people and, they're, you know, they just weren't happy with the way it felt? I wonder if it's the size, if it's, if it's Froyo, or if it's, uh, if it's the battery life. Uh, some mm. people have said the battery life is not great, but I do know a lot of folks who were really excited about the tab once they actually got a hold of it were a little bit less excited. I'm still excited about the BlackBerry Playbook. Maybe the same mm. thing will happen to me. I don't know. Yeah, well, the Playbook at least was a, it was felt different, you know. Um, the Galaxy Tab felt like a big Galaxy phone, <laughs> you know. It felt like, okay, all right, got that. Yeah. Um, the Playbook feels different. And so I will be fascinated to see how it works in the real world and what reception is like. And I think that the return rates are a really good metric to determine how successful something is in a longer term than just sales on launch day. Sony's fight against homebrew and piracy is not going so well. Um, they recently issued a patch, 3.56, that was meant simply to stop the homebrew crack that had been developed from working. This is the one made by GeoHot, George Hotz. That patch has already been cracked. They've circumvented that like that. However, it doesn't. The, the patch doesn't actually change the entire OS. It simply adds or changes files in the old 3.55 software. Uh, that differs from what Sony does most of the time, where it changes the entire firmware. Since part of the software on models with the 16 megabytes of flash memory is stored on the hard drive, those PS3s need to reinstall the software when upgrading the drive. PS3s with 256 megabytes of flash memory store all the software in flash memory so it isn't lost on a drive upgrade. So when 3.56 is a hot patch and requires 3.55 to be installed prior to updating, you can't install 3.56 on a new drive because you don't have all the files. And you can't get 3.55 because Sony checks for software versions and says, no, you have to have 3.56 or we won't allow it to run. Otherwise, people could just roll back to 3.55 and do the homebrew crack. This is so dumb. Basically, the summary on this is uh, if you make complete patches illegal, only criminals will be able to crack their systems and back them up or something. <laughs> Like, this is just so dumb on Sony's part. What are they thinking? Well, yeah, exactly. They're, what they're thinking is the same old thoughts of, like, we're going to stop those pirates. 
uh, and homebrew people at the same time. And this all started when they removed the ability to install a third-party OS. Uh, Ars Technica has an update on their story. It says it looks as if Sony silently pushed out a new version of 3.56 firmware that requires you to manually update the system. Uh, there are no notes on this version, but uh, we may have seen a fix here. We'll have to wait and see how this works out in, in the real world. But they obviously were just in such a rush to get this patch out to stop the crack, which then got circumvented like that. So it didn't matter that they rushed. But they rushed so much that they, they ended up messing up uh, the ability to either put in a new hard drive or restore from the backup. Crazy. Finally, uh, we mentioned yesterday it was the deadline for India to get the ability to survey RIM's BlackBerry devices. And that passed. RIM didn't acquiesce. They didn't change what they've done already. They have agreed to some limited. But they said, well, on BlackBerry Enterprise Server, we can't help you. Uh, India has not blocked BlackBerry. Blackberries are still working in India. A senior official with India's Ministry of Home Affairs told the country's Economic Times no decision has yet been made on extending the deadline, but they do, at the same time, think that the ban on BlackBerry services is unlikely. So isn't that extending the deadline? It No no comment is not a comment, or... Well, I mean, this non, is... They non denial they totally denial? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think they were just... I think people, I think countries are probably gobsmacked that a company will hold to its guns to this level and they don't understand the level to which RIM's business depends on holding to their guns and that one country or even one block of countries is not worth sacrificing the central tenet of their business. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Hey, have you missed the news fuse? Becky? Oh, so much. Oh. Here you go. Enjoy. <laughs> oh. The EFF has started defending John Doe's in those lawsuits that target massive lists of potential infringers in order to send threatening letters and get him to settle out of court for thousands of dollars. This has angered Evan Stone, who is facing them in their first defense. Evan Stone's a lawyer from Denton, Texas, who became frustrated that the EFF's defense was preventing the rubber stamping of his requests, so he's withdrawn the lawsuit he was pursuing on behalf of German porn film Der Gute Onkel. Yeah, did. pretend like you don't know how to say it, Tom. Nice try. Google Latitude just entered 2009. Google on Tuesday unveiled an updated version of its Google Maps Android app that adds check-in functionality to Google Latitude. But since Latitude normally works by tracking you in real time, it can feature automatic check-ins that automatically update your location when you go to a certain place and a check-out feature that will check you out when you leave. That's brilliant. Check out when you leave. Like yeah, it. it's a no-brainer. You can check out anytime you like. Yeah, but and you can also leave. <laughs> it's, better than, it's better than do Hotel they, California. Do they have booze? I wish. Well, some places do. They're called bars. You know okay. those people who pour over every detail in their bill to find the overcharges? Are you one of those people, Becky? Uh, not at all. Then you're not like Patrick Hendricks, who is one of those guys. Hendricks bought an iPhone, turned off push notifications, location service, closed all the apps, did not enable email but still was charged for 35 data transactions over a 10-day period for a total of 2,292 kilobytes of usage. <gasps> Hendrick's lawyers hired an independent consulting firm to analyze iPad and iPhone bills, and they say they are finding a 7 to 14% data inflation on the bills. So Hendrick's is taking AT&T to court the good American way, a class tisk, action lawsuit. Tisk, 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 AT&T. Shame, shame. Uh, Sony's PlayStation Move technology, it may port to your computer. So let's say you want to use that little funky glowing ping pong thing, you know, that they the use move. for the move. Yeah, yeah that thing. Uh, Henry, uh, sorry, uh, Sony's John McCutcheon, who heads the game systems team, is planning to talk about the new Move server project at uh, a March talk at the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. And this is not even confirmed by Sony, this mover, Move Server project. But it is up on the on the GDC website. So, Well, there you go. Uh, they, did, they posted the information uh, about his talk. And uh, the, uh, in the little subset, it says it's for hobbyists and enthusiasts who want to use the controller for PC apps. So 
take that connect. Maybe this will force their hand in making Steve, their announcement. Steve Ballmer said that they're going to do it, so yeah, maybe it will. No Halo, date announced yet? Halo is arguably the most famous first-person shooter ever for consoles, and Connect is the revolutionary controllerless game technology. The two may soon be married in a beautiful <laughs> ceremony involving guns. Microsoft is now the proud owner of ConnectHalo.com, giving life to the idea that the company may eventually build a Connect version of Halo. This according to the next web. This is causing fanboys across the globe to weep with joy and possibly reconsider teabagging. <laughs> If you bought a Samsung PC that's acting kind of wonky, well, rejoice. There's a refund, a refund for you. Uh, Samsung has said it will offer full refunds for anyone who bought a PC with the new Intel 6 series chipset. Uh, there are six separate lines of PCs with these chips that were sold in Korea, but only one line released in the U.S. Intel said Monday that the chipset connecting the Sandy Bridge processors to other parts of the PC system has a problem. Um, Basically, it could cause hard disk or DVD drives to malfunction. Uh, this is a billion-dollar boo-boo for Intel and an embarrassment for the new line of chips. But if you bought that Samsung uh, PC, at least now there's some remedy for you. Finally, Comcast announced a new long-term deal with Time Warner that brings more content to its TV Everywhere-related efforts. I mean, shows from TNT, TBS, CNN, Headline News, True TV, Turner Classic Movies, Cartoon Network, and Adult Swim will be available on Xfinity's website, cable VOD, and mobile apps. And the addition of live streaming video may come later this year as part of the larger agreement between Time Warner and Comcast. Mm. Uh, a quick late ad story here, Tom, that I just saw. Did you see this story? This guy had 4,000 photos on Flickr. Uh, someone used one of his photos in a copyright violation, and he complained to Flickr, and they accidentally deleted his account. And he was using it as backup for a lot of photos that he'd lost. His photos were even uh, linked to on the Flickr official blog. And they disappeared. Oops. 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 <laughs> totally noob to them. So, Sorry um, about that. Just a heads up, maybe um, Flickr isn't the most um, uh, safe Backup. Flickr is not a backup solution. No. Yes. Flickr is, is a take. sharing app. That is the takeaway, friends. Yeah. All right. Uh, finally, you found this video <laughs> on YouTube uh, that you think is going to be the next viral hit, right? I'm calling it right now. This is, so, you know, now that we've got this like strange people with amazing talents that are being discovered on YouTube after the, you know, yeah, the like gold Justin sports. Bieber. <laughs> Stop. I met the homeless guy, you know, Ted Williams, um, who can sing. Uh, so this is, uh, if you're just listening, let me set the scene for you. This is a bunch of two Brazilian guys in a cab. The taxi driver is the one who starts singing Michael Jackson beat, beatbox style. So there's no instruments. It's a guy who's driving a cab with one hand and beatboxing with the other. Uh. I think there's three guys because there's one holding the camera. Plus, he sounds like Jackson. Yeah, that's pretty convincing, I gotta say. Where are they taking him? <laughs> I don't know, he just told me it's full booth. Well, you gotta forgive him. He's singing Michael Jackson. He must have easy pass. How many uh, how many views does that have right now? I don't know. It was like fifty two thousand, but it just it just has one of those three thirty six eight seventy eight. There you go. Yeah, as see? of right now, boom, flying already. Like we, you heard it here first, right? On tech news today, people. All right, on to the voicemail two six zero TNT show is the phone number to give us a call and leave us a comment. We got a lot of comments about the CRTC's uh, announcement allowing Bell in Canada to meter internet and what that's going to mean for your internet bill and your ability to stream video up in Canada. And um, Let's start uh, with this call from Anonymous. I think he was afraid of getting tracked down and charged for using Google Voice. Here's what he said. Hey, Tom and the gang. I was just trying to make a comment that uh, something you all might not have thought of uh, on the TNT show yesterday. Oh, I love the show, by the way. But uh, when you're talking about Canada and uh, the EU and different other metering and kind of net neutrality issues, uh, as a disabled IT professional, uh, I have vision problems, 
it's just something that kind of occurred to me is that the uh, low vision or blind community and even the deaf community use more bits than your average user. I mean, it's just kind of a fact. Uh, for low vision and blind individuals, who listen to a lot of podcasts, a lot of streaming audio. And uh, for a deaf who uh, don't want to use maybe texting or some sort of IM clients and they want to use video communication, that uses more bits. And so in many ways, there could be a discrimination issue here. I wonder if that's ever been considered. Just a thought I thought I'd share. Love the show. Thank you. I have seen a couple other people say the same thing, Becky, that, you know, this unfairly punishes people who have to use more data because the because the cap is so low. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's that. sometimes those kind of issues can really put the brakes on something like this um, once you consider the impact on sort of the entire population. So hard to know. All right. Uh, email address is TNT at twit.tv. And we got a stack of uh, of emails about the Canadian decision. Uh, just to review a few of them, this one from Mike, uh, known as Third Stage in the chat room, uh, points out that the federal government will decide by March 1st whether to reject the CRTC decision on usage-based internet billing. Prime Minister Stephen Harper has requested a review. A lot of people are cheering at that decision, so we will find out by March 1st if this decision stands or not. Uh, also, from Ense Akong, Pointing out SaskTel is a government-owned ISP in Saskatchewan, provides unlimited broadband and wireless with no caps. He says they, they service 13 cities, 535 smaller communities, and about 49,000 farms. So you might want to look into that. If you're on Bell Telus, you can get unlimited broadband and unlimited wireless from SaskTel if they serve your area. And finally, Spencer is on Rogers Cable in Canada and says, hey, don't forget us. It's not just Bell and the people who resell Bell service. Rogers is coming down hard on caps as well. We pay phenomenal amounts of overage fees to Rogers, uh, and they have caps as well. So thanks, everybody, for keeping us up to date on the situation in Canada. I uh, want to hit one more email at least. Uh, this is from Hate Bad Design, uh, who's in the chat room often. But he uh, says, today Google opened the virtual doors to 17, virtu to 17 famous museums using Street View technology. Um, he says, the unwashed masses can get a lot closer to classic paintings that they could never actually hope to do um, in terms oh, wow, of cool. not having access to visit. It's really neat. It's just like Street View, so you can walk through the museum and get a sense of where the paintings are on the wall. And then you can click and zoom into very high res uh, images, you know, down to, you know, the ridges on the oil paintings and the really the individual dots and the pointillism. It's very cool if you're into art. Um, so go check that out. Did individual painters get the option to have their art buzzed <laughs> when the street only, view cameras went by? Only in Germany. <laughs> were they collecting Wi-Fi from, from the, uh, the, the art museums? As they were, they were they rolling have, uh, around, they were yeah, collecting they, they, scraps of paint. Mm -hmm. Did they, they tell had this the partial email from the girl with the pearl earring who was trying to contact? You know, I don't know the whatever the American guy who found her other earring. Yeah. <laughs> uh, finally, Dina, who is also a regular resident in the chat room. Hi, Dina. Says, "Hey guys." Here's a link to translations of the Google Speak to Tweet service. We mentioned this yesterday. Google has worked with Say Any Say Now, Say Now to uh, Say Anything's a movie. Uh, they're, they're working with Say Now to create a Speak to Tweet. So if you're in Egypt, you call a couple of different uh, phone numbers, and your voicemail gets posted by a link on a Twitter account. Uh, if you go to Egypt.alive.in. You can get translations of those uh, because I, I, if you go to the Twitter address, you're just getting people speaking mostly in, a, in not English. Uh, so for me, I, I, I can't understand what they're saying. But these are our translations of what the folks are saying, plus the original um, e e e voicemails if you want to take a listen to them. Uh, but it's a great way to get some man on the street perspective of what's happening in Egypt. Yeah, uh, Jeff Jarvis contacted Google, and uh, they said that they're getting one to two audio tweets a minute, um, obviously all of the translations being um, crowdsourced. And, you know, especially coming on the heels of the, Mub the Mubarak announcement today about, you know, not running for re-election, you kind of, this is a way to get a sense of what that reaction is like that we wouldn't really get given that Twitter and the Internet are down in country. 
And, cool. uh, 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 and just on a totally non-technical note, uh, the, the protests are still going on. President Mubarak has said he won't run for re-election, but the protests are still intensifying. So, you know, to anyone who listens to us in Egypt, we know you can't hear us right now, probably because of the fact that there is no Internet connectivity in Egypt. But uh, stay safe and we hope everything turns out well for you. That's it. Becky, so good to have you back. I will be harassing you tomorrow as well, friend. Excellent. And Excellent. Don't forget, we'll be doing the uh, honeycomb announcement tomorrow morning. Right, at uh, 9, no, 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Check that out. If you are listening to this before then, in other words, go to twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call, 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey, Carol.